Welcome to St. Peter, and welcome to worship. We are nearing the end of our summer sermon series on the Lord's Prayer. We're down to the second to last petition that we make, that Jesus taught us to make in this Lord's Prayer. And as we look at these last two, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, we kind of confront some of the scariest things that we can pray about the temptations, the attacks of the devil on our soul every day, the evil that confronts us, that we see around us in this world, it can be kind of scary stuff to think about. And yet, as we've heard this whole series long, Jesus not only invites us to pray, but promises that he has answers to our prayers. And we'll find that is true today as well as we dig into the sixth petition of the Lord's Prayer, Lead Us Not Into Temptation. We'll follow the order of service that's printed for you in the bulletin, Morning Prayer. You can also find it on page 207 in your hymnals. We'll begin with our opening hymn, hymn 679, God's Own Child, I Gladly Say It. Thank you. 
Please stand. O Lord, open my lips. Hasten to save me, O God. Jesus Christ is Lord of all. Jesus taught us to pray, lead us not into temptation. What does this mean? God surely tempts no one to sin, but we pray in this petition that God would guard and keep us so that the devil, the world, and our flesh may not deceive us or lead us into false belief, despair, and other great and shameful sins. And though we are tempted by them, we pray that we may overcome and win the victory. You may be seated as we join in singing our hymn of the day, hymn 720, for which we will sing verses 1, then 9, then 3. Thank you. 
Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God, our Father, and his Son, our Savior, Jesus, dear brothers and sisters in Christ. A bit of an obscure quote to start with today. Can, do any of you know this? Can you fill in this blank? You cannot stop birds from flying overhead, but you can... Yeah, exactly. Like mother, like son over here. You can keep them from making a nest in your hair. This is often a quotation that's attributed to Martin Luther. He didn't originate it. He actually read it from a book that was already old 500 years ago. The actual origin of this quotation is kind of lost to history, but it's one that was commonly used by Martin Luther and has been ever since when talking about temptation. You cannot stop birds from flying overhead, but you can keep them from making a nest in your hair. Just yesterday morning, I counted 19 magpies between the parsonage and the church. I felt like I was in an Alfred Hitchcock movie. Most of the time, I don't mind those magpies. I do my business, they do theirs. But as I sat down at my office to get some work done in the morning, I kept hearing a noise. Bang, bang, bang. The magpies kept flying into the windows of the fellowship hall. Now, at first I thought I could just let them go and they'll figure it out eventually, right? Don't fly into the window. Doesn't work that way. I don't know if it was the repeated concussive force against their tiny bird skulls or their pea-sized brains to begin with, but they kept banging against those windows. If you were in a situation like that, what would you do? I'm not going to repeat whatever it was that I just heard over here. <laughs> yeah, how would you stop them from flying into the windows? Yeah, put something in front of the windows. We were down in Calgary at the Parsonage there this week, and they put an, a fake owl out front to scare the birds away. That works for a little while, but after a while, they know that it's a fake plastic owl. They don't give a hoot, right? I, all I did was walk out the door. And as soon as they saw me outside, they flew away and never banged their bird heads against the windows anymore at least yesterday. They were out there again this morning. If I had to guess, I would assume they'll be out there again tomorrow. Temptations are kind of like magpies. There are so many of them, and they are everywhere. At just about any moment in your life, you can look out the window and count one or two or 19 of them. You might be able to scare them away one day, but they'll come back the next, and the day after that, and the day after that. You cannot stop birds from flying overhead, but you can keep them from making a nest in your hair. Our focus for today is the sixth petition, which deals with temptation. And perhaps unsurprisingly, the Bible has a whole lot to say about temptation what it is, what it looks like, where it comes from, how God dealt with it, and how we should. So let's start from the very beginning and just answer the question, what is temptation? Our Catechism Glossary provides this definition. Temptation is any situation in which someone may be led into sin, false belief, or despair much like the explanation to this petition that you read just a minute ago. Now, if you think of situations in which someone might be led into sin, false belief, or despair, you could probably come up with a pretty long list. We don't have time today to address every situation that might lead a person into sin, false belief, or despair. But thankfully, we don't have to have a playbook to respond to every single situation in our lives when we know where temptation comes from, when we're able to identify the origin of temptation. The Bible 
provide some answers to that question. This one is from Revelation chapter 12. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who leads the world astray. So what is one of the Bible's answers for where temptation comes from? Satan, or the devil. The devil tempts us into sin. He's the one who tries to lead us astray into false belief or despair. How many of you are boxing fans? That's kind of what I expected. I don't think I saw a single hand go up. Even though you're not boxing fans, do you know what a one-two punch is? It's a combination, right? A qu in quick succession, two punches. That first punch is not meant to be the knockout blow. It's meant to set you up for the second punch to come to be even more devastating, to catch you unaware, to catch you at a time and in a place where you are most vulnerable. The devil has a devastating one-two punch when it comes to temptation. And I think the clearest example of this is the record of the first sin in the entire Bible. You might recognize some of these words from Genesis chapter 3. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say, you must not eat from any tree in the garden? So even before the devil points to the specific forbidden fruit that he's trying to get Adam and Eve to eat, what is he tempting them to think here? Doubt God. Did God really say? And not only doubting God, but specifically doubting that something that God said would be sinful and wrong is really all that bad for you. To her credit, Eve gives a good answer. She says, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. You must not touch it or you will die. So far, so good. But the devil's not done. He goes on, you will certainly not die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. What did the devil convince Eve to think about the fruit that God had forbidden them to eat? That if she eats this fruit, she's going to gain a quality that God had withheld from them. That if you partake of this thing, you'll actually be better off than before. Not only would it be, not only is it not bad for you, the devil says, but it would actually be good for you to eat this fruit. So she did. And so did her husband, who was with her. They bought in to the devil's lies. They fell for that first punch, but this was not the knockout blow. This was just a setup for what was to come next. After they ate this fruit, then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. In the moment of temptation, the devil convinced Adam and Eve to think that sin was no big deal. How did they feel about their sin now? after they had committed it. They were afraid. They were devastated. They were terrified of God. The devil's main occupation is temptation. 
His main objective is to drive a wedge between you and your God. And because he knows that God will never willingly abandon you, he focuses his attention on you and what you might be willing to do. Are you willing to disobey God and step off in a direction he told you not to go? The devil wants to convince you you should. And then the instant you do, he wants you to believe that your sin was so great and God will be so mad at you for committing it that he will never love you again. Which is why Adam and Eve in their silliness and foolishness try to cover themselves with leaves and hide from their almighty, all-knowing, omnipresent God. The devil's one-two punch is first to convince us that sin is no big deal. And then once we've committed that sin to convince us that it is such a big deal that God could never love us. He wants to drive that wedge between us and God and separate us as much as he possibly can. And sadly, he succeeds far too often. What lies of the devil do you believe? How do your sinful desires drag you away and entice you into sin and false belief and despair? It's different with each of us, isn't it? And it's different within each of us at different points in our life, too. When you were really little, let's say between the crib and college, what were some of those temptations that were most common for you in, the, in that age of life? I already see it in my one-and-a-half-year-old. What sin is common for little children or temptation? Lying is one. Did you eat the chocolate cake? No. Then why is there chocolate on your face? Lying is one. Franklin can't speak, so that's not his thing right now. Selfishness. Not willing to share. Taking something that belongs to somebody else. Don't run into the street. What's he going to do? Disobey you and go and do exactly what they're not supposed to do. Those are temptations that are not unique to, but maybe common with children who are young. What about when you're a little older in life, between puberty and parenthood? What are some common temptations that might be unique at that time of your life, strongest at that time of your life? Girls, lust. I would even just lump that all into the lusts of the flesh that the Bible talks about, whether that's sexual desire, adultery, pornography, or overindulgence. Anything that makes me feel good. Or what about later in life when you're dealing with kids or your career? What temptations are common and unique at that time of your life? Pride might be part of it. Pride could certainly go in all of these categories, but I think there too. Impatience or anger. You want things to go a certain way and they're not going the way that you want them to. preoccupying yourself with security, safety, stability, with the trajectory that you anticipate for your family or your career, we end up putting other things before God. Or maybe when you're more mature and the kids are long gone out of the house and after you've retired, what might be a temptation that is common for you at that stage of life? Worry. Fear, maybe even despair at the way that you see things going in life. There could be pride in that moment too because that's really the opposite side of the coin. If, if you think life should be going this way or your kids or your society should be following your direction, then isn't that a, a reflection on what you think your opinion is? Temptations are like magpies. There are so many and they are everywhere. 
just about any moment, if you could look out and count one or two or 19 of them, you might successfully scare them away for one day, but they'll come back the next and the next and the next. When we put it like that, it, it sounds kind of overwhelming to think that we have to live an entire life under these circumstances. But God has an answer. And God has dealt with temptation. He sent his son Jesus to face it and to conquer it and to do it all for you. We read the account of Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 3. Listen to the account of Jesus' temptation in Luke chapter 4. This is a bit longer section. I'm going to read it all the way through right to, right to begin with. But as you see the words of Jesus that I have printed in bold, I want you to speak the same words that Jesus does. So read that along with me. I'll read everything else. You read the words of Jesus. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them he was hungry. The devil said to him, if you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Jesus answered. The devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor. It's been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered. The devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him. When the devil had finished all this tempting... He left him until an opportune time. The devil came to Jesus at a time when he was weak and vulnerable, when he was isolated and alone, when he was hungry and physically weak. At the start of this reading, we heard that the devil tempted him throughout those 40 days. So far more than just the three examples that we read here today. But how did Jesus do? How did he fare when faced with the devil's temptations? He used God's word, and as a result, he was able to resist every single one of those temptations. Where we fail, where Adam and Eve failed under similar circumstances, Jesus prevailed. Jesus succeeded. Never once did he buy into the devil's lies. Never once did he give in to temptation, even in thought. In every circumstance, he was prepared and ready to say no, to resist the devil, to remain pure and holy. And this was important not just for Jesus, but for you. Jesus did this for you. As the writer to the Hebrews puts it, such a high priest truly meets our need. One who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. Unlike the other high priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins, then for the sins of the people. He sacrificed for their sins once for all when he offered himself. What did Jesus' blamelessness enable him to do for you? To pay for your sins. To offer the one sacrifice that would actually work to wash your sins away. There's a whole backstory to how sacrifices work and how sins get washed away. The entire book of Hebrews is basically dedicated to that concept. But the gist of it is this, Jesus had to be perfect so that when he died on the cross, for not for any crime that he committed, 
his perfect life could be substituted for your sinful one. So that his innocent blood could cover over all of your sin. So that when God looks at you, he no longer sees the ways that you have given in and bought into the devil's lies and temptations, but he sees the perfect righteousness of Christ credited to you because of the sacrifice that he made for you on the cross. That's God's answer for temptation. He sent his son to face it and to overcome it. To do what you and I could not do, to win the victory for us. Of course, that doesn't mean we will never face temptation in our lives. Remember, temptation is like a bird. We can't stop them from flying overhead, but we can keep them from making a nest in our hair. Jesus won the salvation from our sins for us on the cross. Our future is certain, but he did even more than that. He gave us weapons with which to fight off the temptations of the devil. He gives us promises like this one in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 that give us the comfort and assurance that we can resist the devil in our lives. It is Within our ability, he says, No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. Three promises in three sentences. What's the promise in the first sentence? You're not being especially tempted. Your situation is not worse than anyone else's. You are not alone. Chances are there is at least one other person in this room who has or is still struggling with the same temptation that you are struggling with. You are not alone. The second promise in the second sentence, what is that? You actually have two. God is faithful specifically in that he will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. In other words, God will never put you in a situation where sin is the only option. And the second promise ties in so well with the third that we'll just go right to it. What is the promise in the third sentence? He'll give you a way out. God will give you a means of escape from temptation. And it looks different in different circumstances for different people at different times in our lives. But think back to Jesus and his temptation. What was his way out of every single one of the devil's temptations? God's word. He was so quick to say, for it is written, for it is written, it is said, For every temptation, Jesus used the word of God. And this is the amazing thing. Jesus is the son of God. He could have just wielded his almighty power and dismissed the devil. But he did not use a power that you do not possess. You have that same word of God in your possession. You can respond with the same words that Jesus did. From experience, we know that it it doesn't always happen that easily. In the moment, we can forget the promises that God makes us. We can forget the direction that God gives us in life. But how can we prepare ourselves to be like Jesus so that the word of God is on the tip of our tongue in any circumstance? What can we do? Stay in the word. Whether that's by coming to church on a Sunday morning, being part of our, our fall Bible study calendar, doing personal devotions at home, sitting down like you did in Sunday school or confirmation class to memorize passages and, and verses from Scripture, or all of the above. 
That way, when the devil comes and finds you in your weakest moment, when you are most vulnerable, you do not have to do a Google search to figure out what God has to say about this circumstance. It's on the tip of your tongue because you've stayed in that word, because you've kept it near and dear to your heart, because you meditate on it day and night. The word of God is the single greatest weapon that he could give you to fight the devil's temptations. Don't let it rust on the shelf. Use it. Polish it. Make it your daily practice. The Word of God is the single greatest weapon He could give you against temptation, but it's not the only weapon He gives you to fight temptation. Here's another from Hebrews 10. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. What's another weapon that God gives us to fight temptation? Each other, fellow believers, all of us here in this room. Because even though Jesus was able to resist the devil's temptations when he was isolated in the wilderness, you and I are not that strong. But together, Armed with the word of God, we can find that strength. Or as Martin Luther put it, when you are tempted by sadness or despair or some other pang of conscience, then eat, drink, and seek to converse with people. When you feel a temptation tugging at your soul, leave where you are. Change your circumstance. Find somebody else to just spend time with. You don't even have to talk about that specific temptation. Just be with them and find the support and encouragement that comes from fellowship with fellow believers. Because as we heard in 1 Corinthians 10, no temptation is overtaking you except what is common to mankind. Chances are there is at least one person in this room who either has or is still struggling with the same temptation that you are. You'll be stronger together then you are alone, and especially when both of you wield the word of God as the single greatest weapon you could use to fight temptation. God equips you to face all those many magpies that come tempting. It may be intimidating. It may be a little bit much to think that every day for the rest of your life you're going to have to resist and fight but God gives you the tools. And even more than that, he gives you the assurance that the victory, the key to victory, is not your strength or skill in wielding those weapons, but ultimately your victory is made sure by the blood of Christ, who lived that blameless and sin-free life, who sacrificed himself on a cross, who washed all your sins away, and gave you the promise of eternal life with him forever in heaven. You have the tools to resist temptation, but Jesus is your victory over it. That's what he wants you to remember. And that's why he taught us to pray, lead us not into temptation. Amen. Please stand. Now may he who began a good work in you carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Amen. We sing.
seated as we gather our gifts to the Lord. This will also be a good time for you to fill out your digital connection card by going to stpeterlutheran.com slash connect. Before continuing with the sacrament portion of our service, just a note of explanation. As we published in our newsletter this month, we are working toward returning to the normal method of distributing the Lord's Supper. Ever since COVID began, we've had to make certain concessions and change the way that we administer the Lord's Supper to you. One of the ways that we're going to return to normal today is by not offering you the individual cups with the wafers this morning. Instead, like we did prior to COVID, our, um, actually I this morning, well, Donovan this morning will take the wafer and place it directly into your hand when you come up front. Now, both Donovan and I have made it our practice and will continue to do so to sanitize our hands before distributing the Lord's Supper. But that's one of the changes that we'll experience today. We're also looking forward to and eager to get back to a return to the, the common cup but we didn't want to spring that on you. We didn't want to bring this back without having an opportunity to talk with you. So we won't offer the common cup just yet, but we would like to hear from you about your comfort level in returning to the use of the common cup. So think about it, pray about it, and talk to us about it in the days ahead, and we'll see how and when we can get back to using it. For now, let's join in continuing in our service for the sacrament portion. I'll ask you please to stand. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord. Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who promised that wherever two or three come together in his name, there he is with them to shepherd his flock until he comes again in glory. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. Thank you. 
Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen.
Please stand once more for prayer. Hear my voice when I call, O Lord. Be merciful to me and answer me. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, you have brought us safely to this new day. Defend us with your mighty power and grant that this day we neither fall into sin nor run into any kind of danger. And in all we do, direct us to what is right in your sight through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And we also pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us praise the Lord. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. You may be seated for our closing hymn, hymn 705, O oh, That the Lord Would Guide My Ways. Glad to be with you, gathered around that great weapon that God gives us to fight temptation, his word, but also an honor to share that word with you this morning. Um, before I let you go, just a few announcements, mostly dealing with everything that we've been talking about for the last couple weeks, um, that with the conclusion of summer, we are looking forward to um, the release of our fall Bible study calendar. You have that printed for you, spelled out in your announcements page. We have, I think, five new Bible classes starting um, the week of September 11th. So look there for some of those for kids who are really little, to confirmation age kids, to multiple adult Bible classes. We have a whole lot to offer you um, starting September 12th. 
To prepare for that, we are um, hosting an outdoor movie night. I think many of the logistics are being handled by the Board of Evangelism, um, but we invite you to attend and to invite friends to come because that's going to be our way not just to have fun while we farewell to summer, um, but also to share with our community some of the many ways that we can share the word with them in the future. On Sunday, September 11th, we'll also hold a special Back to Church Sunday, Potluck and Fellowship. I didn't get the Potluck sign-up printed out for today, um, but it will be there for at least the next two Sundays in advance of September 11th. Um, Spencer tells me that he's got Slovaki on the way. Um, if you don't know what Slovaki is, it's like kebabs um, on a skewer. So we'll put those on the grill, and then we'll have Fellowship, and Spencer says... Some activities like a scavenger hunt, um, I'll let him explain it on a later date, um, but we'll, we'll have something for you guys after church as well. Um, otherwise, I think the, the two things that ask for some help in the bulletin are still looking for help for Sunday school, whether that's a substitute teacher, somebody who's willing to be a teacher's aide just to help out with the kids, um, someone willing to do an occasional craft or activity. Um, if you're willing to help out in any of those ways, it would be a great assistance. Alexa has graciously volunteered to do much of the teaching this year, but we'd really like to support her as we lay a foundation for the children of our congregation. And the other thing, um, I don't know if I've said this out loud to you guys yet, but um, we are um, our congregation is responsible for hosting Fall Pastors Conference in, at the end of September. Technically, it would have fallen on um, Pastor Betcher's congregations, but since he is away, um, we, I stepped us up, I volunteered us to host, um, get the logistics in order for that conference. I've already taken care of the rooms, um, the conference space, all that. But I could use some help if someone is willing to work on the logistics of food for the pastors and their families. Um, there are all kinds of ways that we can do that, but just because it's going to be at Waterton Lakes and in an area that doesn't have a local congregation in it, it'd be nice if we had one or two people who'd be willing to make sure that we can find um, and provide meals relatively easily. So if that's something you'd be willing to help out with, come and talk to me. I'd really appreciate it. Otherwise, I think that's all that's in your bulletin. I think that's all I have to share with you this morning. Is there anything I'm forgetting or anything you'd like to share for the good of the congregation? Okay, then I'll wish you God's peace on the rest of your week.